Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn with Focused Compounding on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we push out into the investment universe. Uh, best way to do that is to follow me on Twitter at, at Focused Compound. And you can go to www.focuscompounding.com, which is our website, to get access to investment write ups from Jeff going all the way back to 2005. Our new podcast schedule is to be in the air on Mondays and Wednesdays and in print on Fridays. Uh, if you're interested in learning about our money management services, you can reach out to me at andrew at focuscompounding.com. So today's podcast, we're going to talk about something that came from Alice Schroeder about Buffett. And it's something that we've never actually spoken about on the podcast before. And this blog, Necker's Alchemy of Money. I'll put the link in the description. If you're on Fintwit, you probably are familiar with this account. He pulled together an excerpt from one of Alice Schroeder's talks that she gave about Buffett after the snowball came out. So this is from an interview in 2010 that she gave. And she had said there's three traits of great investors and um, this thing called the money mind, which is the part that we've never spoken about before that I want to talk about. But she had said, it seems to me that there are three qualities of great investors that are rarely discussed. They have a strong memory. They are extremely numerate. And they have what Warren calls a money mind, an instinctive commercial sense. And she had said that Warren has all of those. So I wanted to get your opinion on this, Jeff what the money mind is to you of these the first two are things that people are probably born with and i wanted to get your thoughts on the third one if it this is a nature versus nurture type of situation if this is something that can be trained over time um but let's talk about this we haven't talked about these three qualities before uh having a strong memory extremely numerate and then having the money mind. What are your thoughts on those? What do you think Buffett's talking about when he says a strong trait is to have the money mind? Yeah, there's a book by Phil Carre which talked about some of that stuff, that money mind idea. Um, the a, a sense of how you're going to make money, to seeing opportunity, and to taking advantage of it. So they talk sometimes some of these people like Buffett and others about things that they did when they were very young. But the other thing is just seeing opportunities to make money seeing how reasonable it is to do it and doing it whether or not it kind of falls into the normal areas of what your investors think of as their job that they're doing so the ben graham memoirs um what he's doing when he's basically um getting started uh so basically in today's sense he'd be college age or so he had graduated from college um yeah, on Wall Street, right? What he was doing, buying up, uh, suggesting to buy bank of railroad bond, uh, bank bank of railroad stock that was going to turn into new stock, uh, seeing it like an option. Some of the arbitrage things that he did, all of that, is figuring out things that is a way to make money. Um, you know, I was reading the book. It's a very good book. It's not really that widely available about uh, Larry Tish. It's um, like King of Cash or something like that. And it's not really, uh, I don't even know if it's been in print and stuff for a while, but it's one of the better books out there for this kind of thing. And he had that. He had the money mind. Alice Schroeder had said that the money mind is far more important than the other two uh, things that were listed. And that Buffett's skills have been compared with the musician. That's exactly right. The money mind is the instinct of sniffing where there is an opportunity to make money and knowing how to exploit it. So I think what she means by that is as he's reading through a bunch of different information, periodicals, newspapers, annual reports, connecting the dots between what he's reading, perhaps from like a pattern recognition standpoint, 
to finding opportunity. Would you say that's that's correct? Yeah, I I don't know if it's a pattern recognition thing or not. You, you know, you'd mentioned the are you born with it or is it something you learn? Um I think the problem with investing as compared to a lot of things we talk about is that I don't think it's I don't think it's realistic to learn a lot in investing. Um so when we talk about, you know, it's compared to other things that are very very simple relative to investing. Don't um so could you learn to be a better poker player? Yeah, but investing is probably more complicated than that. Could you learn to be a better chess player? Definitely, but that's deterministic, you know. Um, this has big random elements to it, but it also has changes in everybody's strategies over time. Um, it, I think overlearning things is a really big problem in investing with people I talk to and everything. So learning some strategy or whatever or whether it even makes sense or not, but it worked for you. And then applying that and trying to apply it again. The money mind thing is seeing unique situations, um, seeing each situation individually and trying to figure out rationally and reasonably using common sense and things like that, whether you'll be able to make money out of the situation. Because there are a lot of different complications to each individual case, which might be different from past ones. And um, Buffett did that kind of thing a lot. That's how he got better returns than like a Graham type strategy or something in the early days is he followed the Graham type strategy, but he concentrated. He picked certain ones where he saw a greater opportunity. Um, so like in the Rockwood arbitrage, right? He didn't um, take the arbitrage deal. He stuck in the stock. That's by looking at it and saying, okay, what's the opportunity here? Whose side should I be on in terms of the incentives involved in all of that? Uh, I don't know that that's something that you necessarily need a lot of experience to learn. I don't know that he was a much better investor later than he was early on in terms of making money. Um, he certainly became better at playing a harder game later on where he'd be much more limited in terms of what he could buy. But I don't know if he still had a million dollars or something, whether he would have much more success now than he did early on, whether everything he learned really helps that way. It helps managing a billion, 10 billion, 100 billion because it's so much harder and the, the edge that you're going to have is so much smaller um, to be able to exploit much smaller sorts of inefficiencies and stuff um, and employ different strategies for that. But I, I think the money mind thing is probably, yes, yeah, something that you're more born with. You learn different strategies for what you could apply and you apply those. But I think that it, it's almost, I, I don't know that the greatest investors actually learn a lot. In fact, I think they might learn less than other people do who are less good investors. I'd love um, to know what you mean by that. Because I don't like, what do you mean learn a lot? Meaning like they find, they will learn one thing and then sort of practice that for the rest of their life. Is that what you're saying? Well, it's like we're talking about AI stuff all the time, right? AI stuff is based on learning things. Um, and learning is fine, but it has some problems. Uh, one, it's going to tend to wait very high frequency type things and very recent things. So if you've been winning a lot doing something, you do 20 arbitrage deals and stuff recently, then you tend to think you should do more of that and everything. Um, it doesn't necessarily look at certain changes that are happening over time that might be difficult to show up in the results that you're getting. We talked about resulting and all of that. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily have a way of dealing with new and... Um, uh, sort of novel uh, situations in terms of the variables involved and stuff. So, like, um, I, I don't know if you could learn to duplicate what Joel Greenblatt did in his hedge fund. You could learn the magic formula, but see, the hedge fund was successful, the magic formula is not successful, you know? So, the a computer can learn to do the magic formula. Well, I'm not sure it can learn to do the approach at Gotham. Uh, because it's a small number of cases, you have to just use reason within large uh, things that you can judge. Um, and the, the, the there's a certain opposition to learning versus the application of pure reason or common sense, whether you want to call it that or whatever. The ability to see a situation to break down what it should, how it should work out and to invest in it. Um, and a lot of the learning stuff depends on high amounts of data that you have for certain things, which means completely giving up on other stuff and other stuff that sometimes had really good returns for people. Um, 
one of Buffett's best investments was probably his person, you know, the, the investment is a private investment that we talked about with Midcontinent Tab Car Company, right? One of um, Graham's best investments was Geico in a private deal. Um, they had to evaluate things that probably were harder to do um, from a learning perspective. They had to do from judging the situation, and I don't know that they would have approached it much differently. Um, now, there are things that they could that they do learn, and we talked about pattern recognition stuff like that. But I think those are mostly reasoning from analogy type stuff, understanding uh, systems and things like that, which I think is not really learning in the sense that we usually mean that it's definitely not learning in the sense of like how AI would learn or something. Um, and it's not learning in terms of the 10,000 hours of practice stuff. Uh, but it is taking ideas from different fields and stuff and applying them by knowing through analogy, what things to apply that might be very important. Checking through a lot of different things. It's more like Munger's, um, you know, that there's certain models that do very heavy lifting. It's important to quickly check through a lot of different things that might have a big impact to notice them, to understand what that's like in different fields, and then to quickly apply that so as not to commit to things probably um, and fall for certain biases and things that would happen that way, but basically not to commit to an incorrect assumption early on. Like one thing that's worrying about the learning thing, right, is there's sort of two ways of doing it that everyone talks about the system one, system two stuff. Um, but I think what doesn't get talked about enough that way is, um, very detailed step-by-step -step logical approach is something that in the behavior finance stuff is kind of talked about as if that's what you want to be. And that if you're not doing that, you're not rational. However, the greatest danger of making really incorrect, um, beliefs about the world and stuff is the step-by-step -step process step-by-step -step is very very dangerous for step-by-step -step logical approach like a mathematical approach of this is that so this is true here that i'm going to take the result from that put it on the next line and do this almost like you're doing a geometric proof kind of thing okay like pure logic stuff that's very dangerous because if you make incorrect assumptions early on that's going to cascade down through everything that you do and lead you to paradoxical and just a totally wrong sorts of conclusions um we can see that if you have a lot of experience in different things and a lot of common sense and a lot of ways to look at it from different angles. Um, but the the money mind thing has to do with like a, a flexibility of thought um, and an independence of thought too. It requires you to be pretty independent thinking because otherwise other people would have spotted this, right? You're going to be pick up the $20 bill on the ground when other people didn't. Um, and two, you have to be pretty flexible because of the ways that it's other people's mistakes or different situations. It's not going to keep showing up the same way. So you have to look at it a different way. Um, and I think that both of those are somewhat contrary to learning. Learning is usually a fairly inflexible type process, and it's definitely not an independent thinking type process. Uh, learning is more conforming type thinking. Um, so I think that's one. And then that's where we get into the humble, arrogant type stuff that people talk about. They talk about how important it is to be humble as an investor and everything, and then they realize, oh, wait, the greatest investors ever are extremely arrogant about their approaches and stuff. So that's part of the problem. Um, that humility stuff maybe doesn't work that well. Why not? It, again, maybe is more connected to the learning type stuff. That's a bit of an issue. So I think it is um, a willingness to try to find angles, if we want to call it that way to look at it and say, what angle can I find to make money out of this deal or something? Or this whatever situation, to read into anything, read in the newspaper and say, okay, how can I make money off of this? And different investors might find different ways to do it, but they are looking at an angle of how do I make money off of it? Um, and I don't think it's an accident, like a lot of the very good investors that we have later on did were involved in like arbitrage and special situations and stuff early in their career because it's something that is sort of thought of as the opposite of the value investing stuff, but many, many of the ones that we talk about had a lot of training in that stuff, which is definitely the money mind approach. So is there anything that anybody can do to train this money mind approach? Is it something that you can consistently work on and, and work to improve? Or what are your thoughts on that? 
I don't know. I'm skeptical. I mean, I think the way Boffer talks about it, others talk about it, it's it's sort of a uh, very, you know, it's not that you're born with it, but it would develop very, very early in your personality and everything. Um, Alice Schroeder says something really good there where she says, you know, something like, you know, uh, how he looks at a business, Buffett, right? And you might look at an animal and see these different attributes or whatever, but all he's seeing is like the, how quickly can it reproduce? How can it survive? Like just those few variables that are going to be key, right? She kind of compares it to like an animal versus a, a business, you know? Um, that's what we're talking about, the money mind thing. Uh, there's certain, the problem with it that I see is that it has certain features that are very basic to people's thought process that can't be changed just for investing probably. So like the biggest one is, with the money mind thing is it seems to be decisive action when you want to seize the opportunity, which people do write about and talk about. Right. But the thing that they leave out, I think is extreme willingness to accept mental tension, right. With the ideas and stuff that you have before then. So a willingness to say, I'm exploring the idea. I'm open to the idea. I don't have an answer yet. Um, like a willingness to say there's a battle going on in my brain between the the Charlie Munger ideas and the Ben Graham ideas and not to flip a switch and say, okay, I'm going over to this side or the other one and an ideological sort of switch. Um, the same thing with investment ideas. When I talk to people and stuff, the big thing that's noticeable is they want to close that down. They want to decide, yes, this is good and I should buy it and then um, I should commit to it that way and I should like everything about it and whatever. Or, no, I need to reject it and all of that. Instead of keeping open-minded that, okay, um, there are certain variables here that would pay off in certain situations and certain variables that would be bad in other situations. And I'm going to keep exploring the idea, seeing if there's an angle that I can take that I can make money off of, but not immediately saying this is good, this is bad. Um, interesting. Telling the difference between an interesting... You know, that's part of the money mind thing is not, uh, this is good, I should buy it. But this is interesting. Stuff's happening here. There might be an angle here for me to make money. Let me watch it. Let me explore. It. Let me think about it. Let me follow it. You know, Buffett makes very fast decisions on things, but he also follows stuff for decades. And then he only pounces in certain situations. He didn't own Geico for like 20 years. And he didn't own it even when it was dropping for a few years there. He never nibbled on it. So, but obviously you follow those sorts of things. So looking for that kind of opportunity and then to seize it. Yeah, it's this idea of like insatiable curiosity, right? Which I do think is more of a nature versus nurture thing. To be curious and to follow. And to your point, you're not even taking action. You're just following it because you're curious for 20 years. And then all of a sudden, yeah. you have 20 years of data or you know backlog or whatever in your brain that you're finally able to act on. I don't know if that's something that people can be taught. I would think that's probably something that's a little bit more nature. You're born with it. Yeah. And, and so for each person, there's probably ways in which they can look at their personality and they can adjust parts of it over to work better. Um, Buffett certainly adjusted parts. Other people have adjusted parts. Um, you know, he has changed a bunch of things about how he interacts with other people and stuff so that he can, for, for various reasons, but also so that it works better in business. Um, so finding out different ways to do that early on was probably helpful. Um, finding different ways to read people and to understand their, their motives and stuff early on looking at these things. So for him, it was more in that side of things, um, teaching him that part of it, right, compared to other people. But for someone else, it might be learning different things that we're talking about, about following a stock without buying it or something. You know, th there's some people, um, Peter Lynch, I think I read a book, Joel Tillinghast, um, they like to own bits of a stock and say that then they can follow better and you don't really know a stock until you own it and everything. Um, other people don't. They just follow it and they, they know it very well, but they don't own it, never have owned it. Um, so uh, th there's even... <sighs> I can even think about from bu the Buff biography and stuff, situations where he mentioned kind of a money-making opportunity or a, a, an angle to someone, even when he didn't act on it. Um, there was one where he was talking about um, 
Rupert Murdoch, which made it clear that he was following the News Corp companies, even though he wasn't acting on it, and that they were going to list in the United States, and they were doing all this, and how much it cost to take control of the company, and what share things there were and stuff. And he wasn't doing that himself, but he was watching and looking at those angles and stuff. Um, so obviously, he reads proxies and, and things like that with a, an active eye towards what does this mean and what's going on, um, beyond what you would just get from an article or something like that. Mm -hmm. How do you think Buffett and Munger's money mind stack up to each other? Are they very similar? Are they different? Uh, I, I think it's similar. Um, Munger and Buffett have different personalities in some ways, but I mean, the money mind aspect, I think is pretty similar. Uh, they do have different attitudes towards risk, definitely. And they have different attitudes towards narrow versus broad sorts of interests, right? Buffett prefers much more and they have different things when it comes to some of the personality, th uh, dealing with people, things that we talked about. But um, so Munger is more likely to speak his mind about certain things than Buffett is to be more confrontational that way. Um, Buffett is more risk averse in some ways uh, than Munger. And, uh, and then um, I'd say that Buffett is much more focused on, on making money. But Munger in the, in the for a period of a few decades was like Buffett and he was very interested in getting rich and stuff. Um, at least as much as Buffett was and maybe doing it faster. When you talk about Buffett has changed certain things about how he operates throughout his life. I mean, are you referring to, um, maybe not speaking with management or having other people do jobs for him or asking questions? Um, what, what did you mean by that? Yeah. Well, I mean, he took the Dale Carnegie course. Um, he learned certain things about how to interact with people that was very different from what he sounds like when he's younger. Um, he stopped talking about political things like, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, you know, there's different things that he learned from that about um, public perceptions and about, you know, uh, his experience liquidating a company and everything. So th there's some stuff on that that changed him, I would say. Yeah, because he had such a uh, bad experience with some things, sure. What are some ideas of the money mind in your own life? And, you know, something that maybe was early on, uh, if you had to like look back and connect the dots, is there anything in particular that stands out to you? Um, I mean, I was, all, I was always looking at things about, you know, opportunities to, to make money. I don't know if this is the right thought exactly, but entrepreneurial things, the same sort of things that Buffett talks about and stuff early on. Um, but in terms of investing things, I think it is. Um, I, when I got a new broker, not a discount broker, so I was young, but I don't remember how young, but so whatever that was in my later teens by that point, probably, um, I, uh, said what the ticker, so, so I just opened the account. And I was ready to make the first trade and stuff and said what the ticker symbol was. And he goes, Oh, types it in, you know, Oh, this can't be right. It says, formerly you know business operations formerly consisted of whatever i said no no, no that's right you know so the first thing was buying a, a business that didn't have any uh, that it sold off all its businesses and stuff didn't have anything to it anymore it was just a corporation with some cash and whatever assets and stuff um that's not kind of be common for people to start as their investments in so mm -hmm. you know your first investment is usually going to be um some big giant stock that a lot of people own or something, not looking at um, specific uh, situations for an opportunity for that you might have an angle on or something, right? Um, sometimes people take it from their own life and stuff, though. You know, it does happen. Or sometimes people act on a tip. Um, you know, Graham sort of talks about that, and I think Peter Lynch caddied and stuff like that. So they, they may mention things early on where there's sorts of those kinds of things where people think about something. Oh, well, maybe it'll go up, and um, I'll have an opportunity that way. But... Um, I think it's usually reading about a situation, looking at how you could make money off of it. Um, but then also weighing the downside and all that, you know, so uh, there, there's a trade off because there's lots of people who have an interest in making a lot of money from a situation and see opportunities everywhere, maybe more than there really are or something. Some other people see risks everywhere more than there really are, you know, so that's also personal. I think that I'm, I'm not sure how easy it is to change that. So I'm so stuck on this idea of like learning from you mm -hmm. and how you, you don't think, I mean, you have to expand on that a little bit because I'm still kind of okay. left a little bit confused. So you're saying that you don't think it's something that 
people continuously do i mean yes i mean if you're going to study an industry you're going to learn a lot about that industry but i don't think that's what you're saying i think it's like more of a bigger macro thing from you i mean can you explain more what you mean by that okay one of the biggest problems that i see with people talking to me emailing me whatever is what i would call over learning um one they switch strategies so a strategy hurts them as long as it hurts them in just like one instance uh, and they learn from that strategy yeah, so they change strategies and stuff. Um, so usually if someone's coming to me, oh, I'm interested in this event-driven stuff, I'm interested in this special situations, I'm interested in net nets or whatever, it's usually because you've just had a bad experience with something else, right? Or you can't find anything else, which could be a reasonable reason to look into these things, but then you also have to be aware that that's why you're being pushed into it and you have to be careful. Um, so that's one possibility. The And then they switch back and forth between things. The strategy works for a while, and then they switch from that. They have pretty strong, almost ideological switches in that way, right? Um, And they... The the other thing with the learning thing is that if we think about it, the the best thing is usually a mix between, like, the influence of the environment on you and uh, understanding that and being realistic about the outside environment. But then also spending some time inside analyzing and thinking about things. When I say overlearning, what I mean is maybe over responsiveness to the environment, seemingly something that's very fit for the environment, but in fact will be extinct the moment anything changes out there. And so um, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't need to know what's going on out in the world. Um, not just macro stuff or whatever, but doesn't need to know quantitatively what strategies work and don't work. It just needs to know I'm looking at something and it makes sense and I'm going to do it. Um, so uh, th- that is a thing that worries me. And and when you learn so much, you can get into almost a thinking of um, not knowing or caring why things do work out the way they do, which borders on thinking in sort of magical terms that something works because it is a net net when a net net must work because it's incredibly cheap or for other reasons that you can explain, but you shouldn't ever think that something works quantitatively, but not be able to explain why that would work. Mm -hmm. Right. Like logically Uh, why it makes sense that it does work out. Right. So, um, Price to anything, whether we're talking EV to EBITDA, price to book, price to sales, price to whatever, it might just work because of low price. That could be a very big component of it. And so low price works and low price works because X, Y, and Z. That, that's fairly s- simple to understand. But why do you believe that sales would work more than some other measure? Why do you believe book would work or current assets or whatever? Um, there, there could be other reasons why you think it would work, but then there'll be exceptions to that. And you can't just buy and assume, okay, I'll get the base rate for everything and, and it'll be fine. Uh, but it, yeah, that worries me. So even in some of the things like, um, when I read the Tilling Ass book, right, um, the he was pretty relaxed about. I didn't detect frauds. That's fine. There's not that common and stuff. He was investing in a very big fund, mostly in the United States. Um, didn't take huge positions in individual stocks usually for that reason. Um, so it wasn't a huge deal but i mean uh and like things like enron and valiant and stuff were just complicated so it kind of avoided them for those reasons but not really taking the attitude that you should be able to differentiate between some things that would likely be frauds and not just on a common sense sort of basis looking at them um whereas when he tells a story about sino forest or something there's strong signs of, of fraud and stuff right away in terms of the story that he's telling so i think that having an approach that would a common sense type approach, not if you didn't, if we don't think of this as a very advanced thing that there's been all this research papers on and there's quantitative stuff on, and we read all these textbooks and and things about it and think about all the time about how, what works and what doesn't. If we get away from that, one of the things would be don't buy a fraud. That'd be pretty common sense. Whether you, there was no stock market and you were just buying things in at home, uh, you know, in in your local town, don't fall for a fraud. Uh, But that's kind of overlooked. As a thing now, now it's it's fine that you could do that. And it's the fault of the fraudsters and stuff. If that happens, you have no responsibility for it. Um, and so that's kind of giving up something that's common sense that you could apply because you kind of get overly thinking about those things. Um, I think you mentioned was it, was it Whitney Tilson who said he got involved in all of this stuff. Um, you know, he hung out with some people who were running hedge funds and things that 
did different things and uh, and he certainly got away from just doing long only um uh value type stuff into doing lots of more exotic things and they were um, making money too so that's hard mm-hmm. from like a psychological perspective if you're best buds with bill ackman and he's making billions of dollars doing you know credit default swaps and all these different securities that are very complicated and are different from what you launch your fund to do which is mm-hmm. bottom up value investing it could get challenging and i think actually i'm not putting words in his mouth he literally did say that he feels like he almost got too smart he started focusing mm-hmm. on all these other things outside of that so i wonder if one way to really distill it down is just it's back to that idea of focus you're uh, focusing on something that logically makes sense and you focus in that lane forever and sort of let all these other crazy things that happen all these different interesting securities or whatever that generate tons of clicks and news and whatever uh kind of let them do their thing while you focus on doing your thing right so like uh i, I think michael burry could probably do that but i don't know that michael burry has a money mind uh i, I would kind of say probably not um uh, because he reminds me of like a global, what would they call a global micro yeah. investor, just very okay, top yeah. down and then go in and find these different ways to exploit whatever he's thinking. Yeah. And so uh, um, some things are like a difference between having an opinion, having analyzed something, having a strong view on it, having a belief about something and acting on that as if it's going to happen or not is very different from a money mind in terms of just, I can make money somehow. Um, one thing about the money mind thing is I can make money somehow, even if I don't have to be very smart or even if I don't have to be very right. Um, a lot of people, you know, are very interested in being very smart and being very right, even if it doesn't make them a lot of money. And someone with a money mind is okay with not really being that smart or right, but somehow they made money off the deal, which can be, I don't know how it will work out, but it's cheap and something will happen. Um, You know, we talk about that with like acquisitions that seem cheap enough and they're in play and I don't know how it'll play out in what years, but plugging what numbers you want. If If it looks like it will still have high annualized returns at not much of a premium over where it is and in closing much longer than people say it will take to close and stuff, then you, you do that kind of deal. Um, kind of reminds me of when Bezos asked Buffett, like, "Hey, your your strategy is so simple. You've been so successful. Why don't more people follow you?" And Buffett had said, "Because they don't want to get rich slowly. It's not exciting." Yeah, yeah. It's also not exciting to have opinions about things or beliefs about things or whatever that necess- that don't necessarily turn into you making lots of money. Um, one thing that was because I just read that book like yesterday or whatever, um, is that uh, Tillingass talks about early on in his career, he he was working at some place that allowed him to make bets, very large bets on um, interest rate directions, right? Because he was doing, he was um, making, he was making predictions about what economic statistics would come in like, and he was working for a bond firm. And uh, so he could bet on the direction of interest rates basically by being extremely leveraged to some sort of um, government bond, right? And uh, he made money for a while, made a lot of money off of it, and then he he lost a lot of money, lost all of it, more than all of it, but luckily, you know, that wasn't his responsibility. So, uh, I mean, because it's borrowed money, right? So, okay, that's all the money I have. All right, fine, it's over. Um, Account closed. But other than that, um, what the... The, the, the issue with the learning thing, right, is from a human perspective, let's take it that way, it's not clear to me whether he was ever right or wrong. And he says that later. I don't know if I was right or wrong. Um, I don't know whether I was right or wrong in the call, really. Like in the longer run, he may have been right on the call of where he saw interest rates going or something, but then he was wrong. Or he was right for a little while and then he was wrong. Um, a lot of times you make money on something that you go back and go, oh, that was bad. I shouldn't have done that. That that was a mistake. And sometimes you don't make money on situations. You go, yeah, that was good. And that's the opposite of learning. From learning, you have to take a completely naive blank slate perspective and not ever make that judgment about the outcome. You have to, like, really learning is saying the outcome is what matters and not that I can judge this was a correct decision or a mistake. So, um, whereas... 
we don't know that Buffett owns uh, that. We know that Berkshire owns Paramount. We don't know that Buffett owns it. I think it's him, right? But if it is, it's interesting how he answers the question when someone asks him about Paramount as compared to how other people would answer a question about a stock they own. He said almost all negative things about the stock. And he talked a lot about, you know, we'll see, keeping it open and, you know, we'll see what happens and everything. Um, it's very different from how you write up a stock, you pitch a thing, or even you talk to your partners and your clients and stuff about why you own a stock, which tends to make you look smarter and stuff. And that's the other thing, you know, having the money mind thing is sometimes, um, well, sometimes people call it leaving something on the, what? Go ahead. Intuition. Intuition. Yeah. Um, well, it has to be an independent analytical situation of what you're trying to accomplish, I guess. So what I was thinking about that is, you know, there was uh, in the outsiders, they mentioned something about how Tom Murphy had a weird way of doing deals. Buffett also had a weird way of doing deals. And uh, Tish also had a weird way of doing deals. Um, they kind of didn't mind leaving something for the other person, right? Which sounds to a lot of the yeah, professors and things like not a great idea, but there are reasons why you would do that. One thing is early on in a negotiation, you might want to figure out if the other person wants to look smart or especially if they want to think they're getting the better of you. Right? So if they do, or, or to have, like say face or something like that, because if they'd want things like that, then it's, then, then you, if you have a money mind, right? You say, okay, I, I want to make sure that I structure things so that it makes you look really smart, makes you say face, makes you do whatever. And you can go to people and do, whatever things are important to you in exchange for money. I'm, I want more of that kind of thing. I want to make sure that this deal closes if that's what I'm really seeking or to get the better deal in terms of money things or whatever. If the headlines come out looking good for you right now for lots of people that won't matter, it's not going to work in a negotiation with Buffett or something, but for other people it will. And, um, being focused on what you're trying to accomplish. That is a big, big part of it that, is you can lose track of what you're trying to accomplish. And the people with the money mind thing are singularly focused on that. And sometimes that gets criticism for them um, in certain situations because it does conflict with other stuff. Um, it, you know, that there's a tension between the trying to make money out of a situation and other commitments that they've made and stuff. So Buffett had big tension, right, with shutting down Berkshire. He wanted to not be a liquidator anymore, but also his money mind was telling him you should have shut this thing down early on in the process. And the two battled out for a long time and probably wasn't a pleasant experience for him for 20 years. Um, the special deals he did in um, bailing out companies and stuff, bad headlines for you. He didn't think they were going to be good headlines for some of those things. I mean, maybe some of the later ones, but certainly when he did the Solomon things and stuff like that, the the earlier ones, he definitely didn't think that that would be positive. He had said lots of things about negative things about investment banks. And then he turns around and invests in one. Why? Because he can't resist something with that kind of coupon and that sort of calculated return that he was going to get on it. So, um, you know, He'll say lots of things about the importance of investing in great businesses and paying a fair price for a wonderful business or whatever. But then how often does he really do that? He goes to Japan and buys a bunch of the trading companies and stuff. He buys oil. Um, so that's the tension that you get from the money mine. Uh, speculated in currencies, basically, right? He just like bought outright some currencies for a little while. Silver, right? Um, so it, you have a thing where you say certain things in public, right? But if you don't have that money mind, then that's fine. You say those and you can act consistently with that. But if you do have the money mind thing, then it's going to bother you that you're leaving money on the table, that you're not taking advantage of situations that are there um, because that calculation is being done all the time. So, and, and that's also the thing with the DCF and stuff that we talk about. I think, you know, she talked about having a strong memory and being extremely numerate. Um, th these People generally have a strong sense of the time value of money and alternatives that they have opportunity costs, right? So there's a lot with that. So there are ways to quickly estimate things that would be similar to like doing a DCF. They wouldn't have to do them. Um, and you know, they could use kind of opportunity costs and think quickly, well, you know, I want to have a guaranteed return that's higher than I could get in bonds or whatever over a period of five or 10 years or whatever. The thing is, as you change the terms of, of the deal 
And you, if you're used to dealing with those kinds of numbers and stuff, would be able to do that. It's not really the ability. To, I mean, they have the ability to do quick mental math, but it's not so much the ability to do the mental math as the ability to quickly turn um, statements about things, observations about the world or something into arithmetic really fast. And just to calculate and go, okay. Uh, because a lot of people won't do that. That's why like, I always recommend to people to have a calculator next to them because for most people, if they don't have a calculator, they won't do a calculation. Um, if they won't do it exactly, especially people who have been trained with Excel and everything. So, you know, if I said like, okay, one company has 10 years of reserves and then it'll expire and there'll be nothing left to the business and another has infinite reserves, right? And they have these kinds of yields or whatever. What's the difference? right? It isn't impossible to do those kinds of calculations yourself or to know rules about those kinds of things. And it's important if someone suddenly switches the terms on you to be like, okay, well, we'll give you 10 years of payments from this thing, or we'll give you something that's a perpetual on this, whatever stuff, you know, if you change any of that stuff. So, and, um, there's a lot of the, uh, a lot of the CEOs and the outsiders and stuff, um, fall in that kind of category where they can negotiate a loan without having a calculator and stuff there and terms can be changed at the last second and stuff. Um, you know, I think I would, it might have been the Cap Cities deal or one of those where people said, you know, they got the investment bankers to figure out the value of the warrants and stuff and Warren just said like what, you know, this is what the warrants are worth and, you know, that was it. Um, so it's not, you know, that, that kind of thing is most people are just not going to do it. They're, whether it's a... You could say it's an inability to do it, a lack of confidence in doing it, an unwillingness to do it. I don't know what the issue is there with why you wouldn't try to calculate out those things in your head when you're talking about them instead of either saying, oh, it's too complicated, I don't want to deal with that, or saying I need to work out a model of it, you know. But you need to be able to do those things quickly because sometimes you'll be offered something where the other person won't realize what they're offering or the market won't realize what it's offering, and it may take some time for them to figure out what is happening here, you know, like the Rockwood situation or something, right? Um, there's not an exact model that worked out what that should be. There is for arbitrage, and so people could quickly recognize the arbitrage and do that. But there isn't for should I do the arbitrage or should I stick in the situation? So you want to be able to quickly do calculations in your head about that. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the Both of Us on the Focus Compounding Podcast. If this is the first time you're joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we have out on the internet. Speaking about arbitrage situations, if you're interested in being able to follow uh, certain M&A uh, and event-driven and different uh, things going on in the market, uh, you could go to insidearbitrage.com by clicking the link in the description and you will uh, be able to sign up through our affiliate link, uh, which helps support everything that we do here at Focus Compounding. Uh, we're going to do a podcast uh, the next one you'll listen to is actually going to be on a real life uh, merger arbitrage situation. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. I thank you ever so much for tuning in with the both of us. And we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.